Tonight's presentation is titled Bolted Joints in Tension. Our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated. He's an author for numerous aviation publications. He holds a certified flight instructor certificate, an A&P mechanics certificate with the inspection authorization privileges. In 2008, he was the FAA's Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year, a member of EAA. Mike has been doing these webinars as long as we've been doing them. We're so thankful for him volunteering his time in the true spirit of EAA members helping members. Thank you so much, Mike. I'm gonna turn control the presentation over to you. Good evening, Tim. Good evening, everybody. Looks like we got a fabulous turnout. We're well north of 700 people in the room. I think uh, of those 500 videos that you have in the treasure trove, I think I've done about 100 of them, Tim. Is that right? <laughs> I think you do, Mike. Pretty, pretty uh, close. You're doing an awful lot. We're so thankful. Um, at any rate, uh, tonight's presentation um, titled Bolted Joints and Tension, it's actually the first of a series of three webinars I'm going to be giving, um, th this one and one in March, and uh, one in April on the subject of, uh, of bolted joints. And you didn't think that th there would be three webinars worth of stuff about bolted joints, but trust me, <laughs> there's a, a lot to, to know about these things. Um, the threaded fasteners are, are ubiquitous in general aviation. If you look at any GA airplane, you'll find hundreds, uh, often thousands of, of them. The bolts are used to attach all sorts of things, wings onto fuselages, propellers onto crankshafts, cylinders onto crankcases, connecting rods onto, onto the crankshaft. Uh, wheel halves together, cowlings, fairings, floorboards, it, pretty much anything that might need to be disassembled for maintenance access is put together um, with a threaded fastener, which, which we'll generically call a bolt. Um, now, some of these fasteners are in, in fairly um, uh, low stress and low demand um, applications. Uh, but some of them are used in, in very high stress safety critical applications. And the, the, the picture here is a, is a, uh, a cylinder hold down bolt, which is a, a very highly stressed and, and critical fastener. Um, and when they're used in these critical applications for holding cylinders on or connecting rods or propellers where the, 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 uh, the bolt is under high stress and uh, typically repetitive stress, um, the, the, the whole notion of a threaded joint becomes a little bit complicated. And it's important to understand um, the basics of how bolted joints work um, because uh, if you don't, you, 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 may, you may get it wrong. And we've seen an awful lot of catastrophic accidents caused by improper uh, assembly of bolted joints and so on. Um, in my experience, mechanics often don't treat these critical fasteners with the respect they deserve, and sometimes bad things happen. So I'm going to go sort of back to basics about how um, bolted joints work, and then talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of, <laughs> so to speak, of, of putting them together. Um, when I talk about threaded fasteners, the, the, they fall into sort of three broad genetic generic categories um, called screws, bolts, and studs. Uh, a screw is um, a threaded fastener that's designed to mate with a threaded hole in, in one of the pieces being clamped together. A bolt uh, is designed to mate with a nut um, on the, on the uh, opposite side of the joint. And a stud is basically a screw and a bolt kind of glued together back to back. It, it, it threads into the, a threaded hole in the workpiece on one end, and it's, it's secured by a nut on the other end. Now, sometimes the, the terminology isn't used exactly right. For example, um, a lot of things that we call machine screws 
uh, are, are actually designed to, to to mate with nuts, and they really ought to be called bolts. But um, but this is basically uh, how uh, what the proper terminology is. And for the purpose of this discussion, I, I will mostly call everything bolts and bolted joints, even though they come in these three different flavors. Here's some some uh, bolt terminology. I'm not going to spend much time on it, just to point out that most um, uh, critical fasteners, uh, threaded fasteners um, that are that are in high load situations um, have two sections, an unthreaded section um, called the shank um, and a threaded section. And um, the the total length of the bolt um, is divided into uh, the unthreaded portion called the grip length and the threaded portion called the thread length. And um, it's important to get those things right. I just finished replacing a turbocharger in my airplane and there were a whole lot of very high stress um, close tolerance bolts that, that all had to have exactly the right dimension and turned out that the fastener kit that came with the turbocharger had some bolts that weren't right. We had to get them replaced. So it's important to get all these dimensions right. Um, cylinders um, are a particularly interesting case, and I'm actually going to be doing a, a webinar about um, the, the intricacies of, of mounting cylinders um, in um, April. Um, called Risky Business, by the way, is the name of the webinar, so you can get an idea of what, what the theme's going to be. Um, but the cylinders are, are attached to crankcases using a combination of studs that thread into the crankcase and through bolts that go all the way through the, the crankcase and, and uh, take a nut on, on, on both sides. Um, in continental, this in big board continental engines, uh, the cylinders are held on by eight threaded fasteners. Um, six of them are studs that are threaded into the into threaded holes in the crankcase, and two of them are through bolts that go all the way through. Um, here's a, a quick picture of a continental crankcase taken apart, two halves with little yellow arrows showing where the through bolts go through. Um, and you can see that they go through right at the main bearing saddle. So the through bolts have multiple functions. They, 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 they hold the crankcase together, they clamp the main bearings, um, they crush the main bearings in so they can't move, and each through bolt um, is partially responsible for holding down uh, a, one cylinder on each side of the engine. So it's a the through bolt is it being asked to do a lot of stuff. Some of the older Continental designs, uh, uh, 0200, 0300, uh, C90, like that, have have six bolt cylinders instead of uh, eight bolt cylinders. And again, in this case, uh, four of them are um, are th uh, studs, and two of them are through bolts that go all the way through. Um, just like the other is just uh, six instead of eight. Lycomings are pretty similar to the big bore Continentals. They use eight fasteners, um, two through bolts, and uh, and uh, I mean, uh, yeah, two through bolts and and uh, six studs. The only thing that's a little more confusing on the Lycomings is that the 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 corner studs um, are the same diameter as the through bolts, so you can't figure out which are the through bolts just by looking at the diameter. Um, but two of these things are through bolts that go all the way through and uh, and the other two big ones and the four little ones are studs that uh, thread into the crankcase. Um, okay, so threaded fasteners are, are basically used in two different kinds of joints that we call tension joints and shear joints. Um, uh, tension joints uh, the are the the load is is parallel to the axis of the of the of the bolt shear joints the load is perpendicular to the axis of the bolt we're going to be talking about shear bolts um, in the march webinar 
and I'll be confining myself uh, tonight to talking about tension joints because there's a lot to talk about. Um, but anyway, t tension joints are, are joints where the um, the load is is trying to pull the joint apart um, in, a, in, a, in a way that's parallel to the axis of the, of the fastener. Um, and so a lot of the things we talked about, pr propeller bolts, um, uh, the hold down uh, bolts and studs on cylinders, um, rod bolts that, that hold connecting rods to crankshafts, those are all tension joints. Uh, wing bolts are mostly shear joints, but uh, beach bonanzas and barons and king airs uniquely have um, wings held on. Uh, with uh, with bolts that are in tension. So uh, whereas most other aircraft um, use wing bolts that are that are loaded in shear. Um, and we'll talk about the shear uh, bolts and how wings mostly are, are held on um, in, in next month's webinar. Um, so if, if this joint is actually a cylinder hold down joint, um, the combustion forces in the cylinder are trying to pull this joint apart 1,200 times a minute. So there's a lot of re repetitive stress on the joint, and it's important to, to understand um, what uh, impact that might have uh, on the bolts. Um, now the key to understanding a bolted joint in tension is to realize that the bolt acts as a very stiff spring. When we tighten the bolt, we're actually stretching it, um, just like a spring. It's very stiff spring, and we're not stretching it a lot. We're typically stretching it, um, you know, a few thousandths of an inch, maybe, maybe a few tens of thousandths of an inch in, in certain cases. Um, but it's the stretch of the bolt that creates the clamping force that holds the joint together. And the, 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 the more we tighten the bolt, the more it stretches and the more clamping force there is on the joint. Um, the force that we apply by tightening the bolt that stretches the bolt is called preload. Um, that, that's basically how much spring tension we're, we're, we're setting up by tightening th that, that uh, fastener. And the preload creates an equal and opposite clamping force that holds the joint together. And we'll be using the term preload quite a bit. Now, um, just like a spring, if you tighten a bolt and stretch it, and then you relieve the, the, the tightness by, by unscrewing the nut, uh, the bolt is supposed to return back to its original length. And it, so it acts. It acts like a spring, and and it uh, the, the ability of a bolt to return to its original dimension when the load is removed from it is called its elastic property. Um, but if we were to tighten the bolt too much, if it's over tightened, just like a spring that's pulled too much, it will deform permanently, and basically ruin the bolt um, and what in metallurgical terms what we say is the bolt um, uh, became plastic uh, instead of elastic meaning it deforms and it doesn't return to its original dimension um, the amount of force that we can put on a bolt before it starts to deform permanently is variously called the elastic limit or the yield point of the bolt and most bolts that are used in critical applications um, are rated with something called a proof load, which is um, a little bit less than the yield point. It, it gives you a little bit of safety margin beyond the actual yield point. And the proof load is supposedly the maximum preload that we're allowed to, uh, to, to put on that bolt in, uh, so that we're, we can make sure that we don't ruin it. Okay, so let's suppose we have a joint and we tighten the um, the bolt um, 
to stretch it enough to create 2,000 pounds of preload or 2,000 pounds of clamping force on the joint. And I'm picking 2,000 pounds because that's roughly what a cylinder hold down uh, fastener um, uh, is, is tightened to, roughly, roughly 2,000 pounds of preload. Um, okay, so we, we've, we've tightened this thing. We have 2,000 pounds of clamping force on the joint. And then we put a load on the joint of 1,500 pounds. What happens to the joint? What happens to the bolt? Well, since the load is less than the, than the clamping force, the joint does not separate. It, it stays motionless. And because the joint doesn't separate, the bolt doesn't have any additional stress on it. Um, so colloquially, you can say that the bolt does not feel the 1,500 pounds of load. It, it had 2,000 pounds. It was stretched to 2,000 pounds worth of, of, of clamping force before we applied the load. And it's still at 2,000 pounds of clamping force after we apply the load because nothing moves. Uh, the bolt doesn't stretch um, anymore. Now, this can seem a little counterintuitive. A lot of people would look at that and say, well, you know, if we add 1,500 pounds of load, then the bolt's going to be feeling 3,500 pounds. But that's not the way it works. Um, the, the, the bolt will not feel any additional load as long as the load on the joint is less than the preload on the bolt or the clamping force on the joint, same thing. Um, so we can apply this 1,500 pounds of load repetitively, you know, at, at uh, 2,400 or 1,200 times a minute, and the bolt won't feel it. The, the, everything is totally stable, nothing is moving, and the bolt is feeling a, cons a, a constant 2,000 pounds of preload and, and nothing more. But now suppose that instead of loading the joint to 1,500 pounds, we load it to 2,500 pounds, a little, uh, 500 pounds more than the clamping force on the joint. Well, now what happens? Well, what happens is the joint separates a little bit. How far does it separate? It separates far enough to stretch the um, to stretch the bolt so that it is now at 2500 pounds of preload and, and everything's at equilibrium so if this happens 1200 times a minute the bolt is feeling repetitive stress it's 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 rapidly changing from 2000 pounds to 2500 pounds over and over and over again and it's it's uh, feeling uh, repetitive stress um, because the load on the joint is greater than the preload on the bolt. So if we repeat this 1,200 times a minute or 7,200 times an hour, um, a couple of bad things are going to happen. The first thing is that the bolt, because it's being repetitively stressed, is going to eventually fail in fatigue. And uh, the little pictures up there show a, um, uh, the upper one shows a cylinder hold down stud that failed from repetitive stress fatigue. And the, uh, the, the other picture down lower is a through bolt that failed through repetitive stress fatigue. And, and by the way, notice that when bolts fail, they almost always fail at the threads because the threads are all stress risers. And, and so that's, if, if there's gonna be a fatigue failure of a threaded fastener, it's always gonna happen at the threads. In fact, the, the three threads closest to the load are where almost all of the, the stress is. Um, another bad thing that will happen uh, if the joint is separating slightly, um, 1200 times a minute, is that the nut will most likely start to self-loosen. Um, 
And as the nut self loosens, it relieves the preload uh, and makes the difference between the preload and and the, the joint load greater and greater so that the bolt will gradually feel more and more stress each uh, during each load cycle. So you get into this downward spiral where um, uh, where, where the, the, the bolt will feel greater and greater uh, repetitive stress until, until, uh, until the joint fails. Um, so it's super important that we get the preload right on these, on these critical fasteners to make sure that the preload is greater than whatever the highest load on the joint is going to be so that nothing can move and there isn't any repetitive stress on the fastener and the nut won't self-loosen. Now, um, I've described, just described a slightly oversimplified version of what actually happens. And I'm going to take a little time to, uh, to explain uh, the subtleties of what really happens, but I'm going to put up a, a geek alert thing here because if you don't, if you don't want to get this, it's not really all that important, but just to, to give you a full explanation, um, the the description I just gave you um, made the assumption that the joint itself is infinitely stiff and and doesn't uh, compress or decompress with load. That's not true in the real world. In the real world, uh, joints are not infinitely stiff and incompressible, and they actually um, decompress with load and then recompress when the load goes away. Um, so when the joint is under load and, and decompresses, um, it does cause the bolt to stretch ever so slightly, even if the load is, is less than the bolt's preload. Um, how much uh, the bolt feels depends on the relative stiffness of the bolt and the joint. Now, under normal circumstances, the joint is much, much stiffer than the bolt. Um, and when the joint is much stiffer than the bolt, the bolt feels very, very little load. It feels a, a tiny bit, but it feels very little. Uh, a joint that where, where the joint is a lot stiffer than the bolt is called a hard joint. And we always want critical joints to be hard joints. Um, on the other hand, if the bolt is stiffer than the joint, or the joint is less stiff than the bolt, then the bolt will feel much more of the of the load, and it's called a soft joint. Um, the The classic case of a soft joint is a bolted joint that has a gasket in the middle, uh, where where the gasket um, can squish under. Um, under the preload and unsquish a little when the joint is being pulled apart. Um, and uh, so we never, we try never to have gasketed joints in, in high stress situations. That's why, for example, you're not ever allowed to use any sort of sealant when you're mounting a cylinder or putting uh, uh, crankcase halves together or anything because any sort of sealant or gasket or anything like that would turn what should be a hard joint into a soft joint and would transfer much, much more load to the fasteners uh, than they're designed to, uh, uh, to accept. Um, I'm sorry, I, got, I think I, I was a slide behind. Um, and if you really want to get geeky, uh, there are bolt uh, uh, joint diagrams that look kind of like this, where the red line, the slope of the red line represents the stiffness of the bolt, and the slope of the green line represents the stiffness of the joint. And in a hard joint, which is most uh, um, critical joints or hard joints, the bolt is much, much stiffer than, than, the, uh, than the bolt is. Uh, shown by having a much higher, a much greater slope 
in this bolt in this diagram and the bolt feels only a very small amount of the load applied to the joint but in a softer joint where the the the, the joint itself can flex uh, the bolt feels a lot more and um, we, we want to try to avoid that um, so that's why it's important for the joint to be as stiff as possible and for the bolt the, the, the bolt not to be excessively stiff um, one really problematic joint in this regard it has to do with the through bolts that go through a, a crankcase because if you think about it a crankcase um, is is kind of squishable under load. The, the, it's it's a big thing, and the and the aluminum casting can flex, and so the, in in order to not have excessive loads on the uh, on the through bolts, they have to make the bolt less stiff than it normally would be, and the way they do that is they reduce the the shank diameter so that although the threaded end that sticks out of the case has a larger diameter the actual shank that runs through uh, is neck down to make it um, stretchier to make it less stiff um, the same approach is taken for example with with most connecting rod bolts the there's a lycoming connecting rod bolt there and you'll notice that the shank is uh, reduced in size compared to the the threaded area and again that the reduced shank is is designed to make the bolt a little stretchier and uh, therefore to make the joint stiffer and to have less of the repetitive stress and uh, uh, connecting rod bolts are the most highly stressed fasteners in the entire engine um, uh, and, and so it's really important that that joint be be a hard joint and uh, so they neck the the bolts down to make them a little stretchier so that the 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 joint itself is much stiffer than the bolt and and so the joint um, takes the, the majority of the stress and the bolt takes only a little bit of the stress okay let's talk a little bit about how we tighten these things and of course, the traditional way of tightening um, threaded fasteners, particularly critical ones, is to use a torque wrench. And uh, that's what we all do. That's what we're all taught to do. That's what the maintenance manuals tell us to do. They always give us torque specs for everything. And if we don't have a specific torque spec, there are standard torque tables that for, for various diameters of threaded fasteners, um, coarse threads, fine threads, and so on. Um, now, the unfortunate thing, and I'm going to be talking a lot more about this um, in, in my April seminar, uh, in the Risky Business Seminar, but, but the, one of the problems is that tightening um, fasteners using a torque wrench is not a very accurate way to establish a, a, a desired preload. And it's not because the torque wrench itself is inaccurate. Tor the torque wrench can be perfectly calibrated. Um, the, the problem is that when you torque a threaded fastener, the lion's share of the force you're applying with the torque wrench is not being used to stretch the fastener but it's being used to overcome friction. Um, there was one study that showed that 47% uh, of the torque that's applied is used to, under, uh, to overcome friction under the bolt head or under the nut. In other words, between the fastener and the pieces being fastened. And 38% um, is lost to friction uh, between the mate, the mating threads, um, and when you add all that up, you, it, it's it's eighty five percent. But if it was always exactly eighty five percent, it would still be okay because we could we could compensate for that. But the problem is that the frictional losses are not very predictable. Th that there's tremendous variation in how much uh, of the torque is lost to friction. It's always a lot. 
but but it you know it might be 90% or it might be 60% <laughs> and and it's hard to predict exactly how much is going to be lost because there are a lot of variables that affect those frictional losses um whether the fasteners are lubricated or not most fasteners are torqued dry but certain critical fasteners like cylinder hold down uh, fasteners for example are supposed to be um, torqued wet with lubricant on there. Um, the presence or absence of plating can make a big difference. Most of these fasteners are CAD plated steel and the cadmium plating, plating is very slippery and, and reduces the friction, but if the CAD plating is worn, um, then the, uh, which is, which typically happens when you're reusing the fastener. Um, like for example, when a cylinder comes off and goes back on, normally the, the, the studs and the through bolts stay in place. And so the, they're, they're being reused every time a cylinder comes off and goes back on. And when the, when the fastener is reused, um, the, the plating gets worn off. Um, the condition of the threads, I'm going to show you a picture on the next slide that will, will, will be a bit of an eye opener, but um, how many times the, the bolt and nut are reused. Every time a fastener is reused, um, the condition of the threads deteriorates and the amount of, uh, of frictional losses increases. So all of these variables result in the fact that when you torque a fastener to a particular torque spec, you can't be sure of exactly what preload you're generating because you don't know how much of that torque that you applied is, is lost to friction. Here, here are those pictures I wanted to show you. Um, th this is a, these are, um, are micrographs of, of uh, a threaded fastener um, that, was, that was reused five times. Uh, the, the, it was tightened and loosened five times. And the picture on the left is 25, times magnification you can just kind of start seeing the damage to the threads and the one on the right is 500 times magnification that's kind of a shocker um, because the the surface is is really a lot more torn up at the micro level um, that than you might imagine so the reuse of of these fasteners is a huge problem in terms of achieving the proper torque now there is a better way to tighten these fasteners and to get exactly the preload that you want. And, and that is to tighten them not to torque, but to tighten them to stretch. And in fact, uh, on most like homing engines, the, the, um, uh, the connecting rod bolts are tightened to stretch. And, and it's, it's, they use a special kind of micrometer to measure the length of the bolt. And you tighten it until the bolt has stretched a very specific um, amount and tightening the fastener to stretch rather than to torque eliminates uh, the, the all of the uncertainty associated with friction you know that you're going to you're, you're applying the exact correct preload to the bolt every single time when you tighten a fastener to stretch like this um, unfortunately um, there are an awful lot of fasteners that it's not practical to tighten to stretch. For example, you can't, there's not a good way to, to, to tighten a stud to stretch because you don't have access to both ends of it to, to measure the length of it. Um, in theory, I suppose you could tight, tighten uh, through bolts to stretch, but you would need a, a gigantic micrometer that hung from the ceiling with a crane or something that that would would go the entire way across the engine and 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 measure the length of the through bolt so practically speaking it, it would be really really hard to use the stretch method uh to tighten through bolts and it's just about impossible to use the stretch method uh to tighten studs um but it is the most accurate way to do it and as i said lycoming connecting rods are are, are tightened in this way to stretch um, but it turns out there's a third method um, of, of tightening fasteners that's almost as accurate as stretch and almost as easy 
as using a torque wrench. And it's a method that is very, very seldom used in aviation for some reason, although it's used in all sorts of other things. It's, uh, in, uh, it's widely used in automotive stuff, especially high performance and race car engines. Uh, I, I talked to a, a guy who uh, maintained uh, um, big locomotives and they use, they use this method extensively. And that method is, is referred to as the torque angle method or the torque turn method. I'll call it the torque angle method for the moment. And the way that works is this. Uh, to tighten a fastener using the torque angle method, you first snug the fastener up to an initial pretty light torque, just enough to make sure that all of the stuff is, is in good contact with one another. Generally speaking, uh, a good starting place um, would be about half the final torque, uh, just to get things snugged up. It's called snug torque. So you start off snugging the joint up to a light snug torque. And then instead of using a torque wrench to uh, tighten it to final torque, you use an, a, a, an angle gauge like the one in the picture um, to turn the, um, the nut or the bolt head a certain number of degrees further. And if you think about it, if you turn um, a, a threaded fastener a certain number of degrees, you will stretch it a completely predictable and 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 uh, repeatable amount. So the 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 torque angle method again is it consists of two steps. You snug things up with a torque wrench to a light initial torque. And then you use uh, a protractor, basically, um, to tighten it a certain number of degrees further to achieve the final torque. The torque angle method is much more accurate, much more predictable, almost as accurate as, as, uh, as uh, tightening to stretch. And yet it can be used on almost uh, any fastener because you don't have to have access to both ends and so on. Um, it's always been a mystery to me why we don't use this method in, in aviation very much. Um, catastrophic engine failures following cylinder work, uh, that, especially when it's performed in the field as opposed to in an engine shop or uh, on the assembly line at the factory. Um, uh, but catastrophic engine failures right after cylinder work are, are depressingly common. I, I've been involved in uh, either an investigation or as an expert witness in at least half a dozen cases of, of catastrophic engine failure caused by, uh, you know, just following cylinder work. Um, and the failure is almost always attributed to inadequate fastener preload. And in my April webinar, I'm going to be talking about why it's so difficult to get the preload right when you're doing cylinder work in the field. Um, and and it's, it's actually a very interesting story, and I'm, I'm going to do a whole separate webinar on it. But the, the bottom line is I'm convinced that if Continental and Lycoming published torque angle specs for tightening uh, critical fasteners like through bolts and hold down studs, um, that most of these uh, catastrophic engine failures following cylinder work could be avoided. And um, the question is, why don't they? Interestingly enough, Rotex is the only aviation engine maker that I know of that actually does use uh, the, the torque angle method for, uh, for, for tightening certain critical fasteners on Rotex engines. But uh, Continental and Lycoming don't, um, and they don't seem interested in doing it. Um, it's a little, a little, strange to contemplate why I have some kind of some feeling that the corporate lawyers might have something to do with it because th this is always a big problem in aviation if if say Lycoming came out and said hey we have a better way of of, of uh, securing uh, cylinder hold down fasteners when you're mounting a cylinder on an engine um, every plaintiff lawyer in the world that 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 was representing a client that had a cylinder come off would 
would go sue Lycoming saying, well, you know, you, you, you knew or should have known that this is, that this is this better way is the way you should have been doing it. And so I, you know, I, I suspect that has a lot to do with it, but, but in any case, it's, it is definitely a better way to do it. And it would be really nice if, um, if, if, the, if these manufacturers would change uh, on these highly critical fasteners that, that have a history of, of, of causing problems, uh, if they would uh, publish specs for tightening them using the torque angle method. And uh, with that, um, Tim, why don't we open it up for some questions? All right, Mike, excellent. Man, we got one comment here. Uh, excellent, Mike. Most mechanics don't know this stuff. You nailed it just as well as my engineering professor. All right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Walt is wondering, are critical fasteners that are preloaded reusable? Well, again, um, th there aren't strict rules about that, but the more you start reading the literature about how much um, the frictional losses uh, increase um, on fasteners that are that have been reused a few times, um, the the more you get convinced that you shouldn't do it if you can possibly avoid it. Uh, so my recommendation and what I what I personally do is uh, I I try never to reuse any sort of a critical fastener. I would never put a a, a a cylinder hole down nut back on after a cylinder change. Um, you sort of have to draw the line somewhere. Um, you know, restudying the case for for changing a cylinder is uh, is probably not a real practical thing to to do. And pulling through bolts and replacing them is is not the easiest thing in the world to do. So, Generally, th that isn't done, um, but because these fasteners degrade, um, um, just you know, one of the things that I always recommend to people is to try to avoid replacing cylinders unless you absolutely have to, because um, the more often these things get reused, the 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 more likely it is that you're not going to get adequate torque on them, even if you follow the the instructions exactly. Um, so you always want to inspect the the threads on all these fasteners. You always want to clean them. You always want to slather them with lubricant, which is something that is frequently not done. Um, uh, mechanics tend not to like to make messes. <laughs> And to 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 do a cylinder change properly requires um, a lot of oil and and uh, and a bunch of mess that you have to clean up. But if you do it in a tidy way, you're not going to get enough lubricant on there. And I, you know, never never tr never try never to reuse a critical fastener if I don't have to. Like I said, when when I just changed my turbocharger, um, all those bolts and stuff those close tolerance bolts are pretty expensive but i threw them all in the garbage and put all new ones in because uh, there's from a safety standpoint there's nothing much more critical than a turbocharger installation it can if, if it starts coming apart it can uh, it can uh, turn you into a crispy critter so uh, we don't want to play games with that um uh, but try to try never to reuse a fastener if you can possibly avoid it. They, the more I read about this and the more of the research papers that I've looked at, the, the more scary it is in terms of the effect of reusing fasteners. Paul's wondering, does the torque angle depend on the starting position? Seems like a little starting tightened bolt will require less angle. Yes, it, it. I mean, it's it. It does start. It does um, depend on that, and that's that's why uh, you, you start from a predictable spot with with you know what I've called snug torque. Um, you know, it, it, if you if, if you look at how a fastener reacts to um, 
to movement of 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 a wrench um it it's the or uh, excuse me if you if you look at how a fastener um responds to uh, to to increasing torque um the the um preload on the bolt um as torque increases doesn't go up linearly it goes up almost exponentially and the the vast majority of the preload that's put on the bolt it, uh, goes on there in the last bit of 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 turning the torque wrench um so we we start with a snug torque which really doesn't stretch the bolt um uh, any kind of measurable amount its only purpose is to ensure good metal to metal contact between all of the components of the joint so that things don't move when you when, when you apply the, the the final tightening using the protractor um, but we're not trying to 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 really preload the bolt uh, significantly we're just trying to make sure that everything's in in good contact and as I said is it sort of a general guideline um, tightening the bolt to half the final torque which really is much less than half the final preload it's like a tiny fraction of the final preload but it's half the final torque um, will is a good starting point for uh, for the torque angle method philip wonders does the torque angle method require a certain temperature to be used no again if you think about it um the the turning the 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 nut a certain number of degrees will give you uh, a a reproducible amount of, of of stretch um any temperature effect would be you know very very tiny and i mean i assume that this is going to be being done at some kind of reasonable room temperature and not at 400 degrees or something like that um, but the, the temperature effects would be almost negligible in tightening um, the sorts of fasteners that we're talking about. Quite a few people have asked a question like this. Um, Joe's wondering, how do you determine the torque angle value? And, and, and uh, Chris That's, is saying, and is there a rough way to convert torque specs to an angle spec? So yeah, you get this? The, sadly, there isn't. Um, the, 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 you... <laughs> The, uh, if anybody really wants to get deep in the weeds on this, you can send me an email, and I, I will uh, refer you to the 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 textbook that's the Bible on this subject, which is a very big, complicated thing. Um, and I suppose, in theory, you might be able to sort of reverse engineer a torque spec and turn it into a torque angle spec, but it would be a very difficult. Um, uh, engineering challenge. Um, that's why, you know, we really are dependent on the manufacturers to, to who, who are doing the engineering in the first place and know what the desired preload is uh, to to publish the, the 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 right specs and why it's sort of disappointing that Continental Lycoming do do not uh, offer a torque angle specs for tightening these things. Um, on the other hand. Um, if you were to um, assemble, let, let's say we're talking about a, a, a Lycoming through bolt, okay? Uh, if you were to assemble a Lycoming through bolt with a brand new through bolt and a brand new uh, set of nuts and lots of lubrication and, um, and, and a perfectly calibrated torque wrench, and you tightened it to half the final torque, and then you tightened it to the final torque, and you kept track of how far you had to turn the nut, how many degrees you had to turn the nut to go from half final torque to final torque. Then you could write that down and say, you know, that's my own personal torque angle spec for this Lycoming through bolt. And if you use that, that same torque angle spec in the future, 
um, on cylinder changes in the field where the through bolt wasn't new and uh, conditions weren't optimal, you would you would wind up with a much more reliable result um, than than doing it simply by using the torque method as as is published in the in the overhaul manual. Um, so if anybody wants to take on that project uh, with a, a like a, a nice new Lycoming engine being overhauled at an engine shop where all this stuff is being done under laboratory conditions, it would be really nice if somebody wanted to publish those specs. Um, but Lycoming doesn't seem to be in the mood for, for doing that and Continental doesn't either. <laughs> James is wondering, what is the recommended time between torque wrench calibration? Um, well, I, I think I think there's actually an FAA requirement, at least for repair stations, that uh, that the wrenches be recalibrated once a year. And Eric is wondering: Is a beam style torque wrench more accurate than the common spring detent style? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, the 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 best torque wrenches now are are uh, the digital ones that use load meters and stuff, and they're just like super accurate, and they keep their calibration because they basically don't really have any moving parts. Um, but beam beam style torque wrenches are kind of hard to use because uh, you 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 have to have your head in the right position to be able to reread read what the thing is saying. You can't just uh, turn it to the click or in the case of a digital one to the to the beep mm. darren's wondering i have a pair of factory reman i just installed on my cessna 310 i assume cylinders do we need to retorque the nuts or through bolts um probably not if if, if they were factory rebuilt uh you can be sure First of all, that that there was all was were all new fasteners because Continental will never will never reuses the fasteners. They always restud the case and use new through bolts and everything. And um, the second thing is, if you, if you ever go to the Continental factory and look how they put those things together, um, they don't use a normal kind of adjustable torque wrenches on the assembly line. Um, each of the assembly workers has a special fixed torque wrench that that is preset basically to one particular torque and isn't adjustable so it's impossible for him to make a mistake because the the torque on that thing is essentially welded in position and those things of course get recalibrated a lot so you know and, and the other thing we'll be talking about this more in the um, in the uh, April webinar, but one of the things that's really important to get um, the correct torque on a cylinder hold down fastener is to be able to go um, from the snug torque to the final torque in one smooth motion of the wrench as opposed to taking multiple bites. Um, because if you take multiple bites, you wind up coming up short typically because um, it, it has to do with breakaway torque being much higher than running torque. Um, it's sometimes pretty difficult to achieve that final torque with one smooth motion of the wrench when the engine is mounted on the airplane with all sorts of stuff in the way. Uh, it's usually very easy to do that when the engine is mounted on an assembly stand uh, like it would be in the factory or in an overhaul shop. So that's another reason why uh, what, when engines are overhauled or initially built or rebuilt, um, the, the preload is usually pretty accurate because they're doing everything under optimal conditions. When you're changing cylinders with what we say is on the wing, <laughs> um, I think that expression came from twins, but it, 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 it meaning we're, we're doing it in the field with the engine actually still mounted in the airplane. Um, it's a whole lot more difficult to get uh, an, 
accurate preload. And almost all of the catastrophic engine failures that, that I've um, been involved with having to do with cylinder work or all had to do with cylinder work being done in the field with the engine mounted in the airplane. Um, it'd be very rare for that to happen on a, a, a new, a rebuilt, or a freshly overhauled engine. Uh, that, that almost never happens. Mike, several people commented on, I think it was slide 30, where you were showing the um, 7,200 number as a result of the, the 1,200 cycles per minute. Uh, people just wanted to point out the math. They thought it might, instead of been 7,200 an hour, it's actually 72,000. That's correct. Hour. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> as as you were saying it, I was doing it in my head, and I didn't say, "Oops." <laughs> yeah. So maybe after the webinar, go back and adjust that slide for your for your next presentation. Yeah, we need to do that. Sorry about that, guys. Um, David uh, was wondering, what type of lube do you recommend for the nuts and threads? Well, um, Continental and Lycoming um, have slightly different recommendations. Uh, Continental says use 50 weight engine oil, which isn't a particularly good thread lubricant, frankly, but that's what they, that's what they say to use. Um, Lycoming says use a, I think it's a 90-10 mixture of um, 50 weight engine oil and STP. <laughs> which I don't even know if you can still get STP. That's the, isn't that the old Andy Granatelli <laughs> stuff? Oh, um, but it, but it, 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 STP was an extreme pressure lubricant, whether you can still get it anymore. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, but that's what the, what the official recommendation, uh, what the official recommendation is. Um, I, I would probably use something like a 90-10 mixture of 50 weight oil and cam guard or something like that, because I, I know I can get cam guard and I'm not sure if I can get STP. Mm -hmm. uh, but just 50 weight engine oil really isn't isn't a great thread lubricant, but it's it's it is what Continental's um, overhaul manual recommends using. And John is wondering, should the um, washer on the base of the nut also be lubricated? Um, everything should be lubricated, but uh, uh, typically, uh, certainly on Continentals, there is there are no washers involved. They're, they they use what are called flange nuts, which are nuts that kind of, in a way, have their own built-in washer. They but, um, you know for a fact that that like homings use a washer under the nut because I, I like I say I know on Continentals there's there's no washer. Okay. Don't know. Um, so Bart is wondering, is there a way to inspect cylinder fasteners for proper torque um, if the previous owner did cylinder work? So basically, how do you go in and check these things is what Bart's asking. Yeah, you know, that's that's a real that's a real problem. You, you can I mean, you can put a torque wrench on the fastener and and. You know tighten it to final torque and see if it clicks with anything moving. That's not a really accurate way to check it because as I said, breakaway torque is much higher than, than final torque. Plus, you know, you're, you, you, you're, you're checking the torque with no lubrication on there. So that there's all sorts of reasons why checking it that way um, isn't going to give you a, any any really accurate information unless the thing is grotesquely loose of course um you know the only the only way to do it if you if you're suspicious of it really would be to uh, to to back off the nut and then retorque it and if you're going to do that and and you need to lubricate it. And if you're going to do that, you might as well take off the nut, throw it out, and put a new one on while you're at it. Um, but you'd want to lubricate the thing up real well, make sure the threads are are, are clean and there isn't a lot of damage on them. And um, then you'd want to lubricate them, put a new nut on, and, and and repeat the torquing sequence. And that's sort of a a big pain in the neck. I'm sure that's not really 
uh, what what he had in mind. But just checking it with a torque wrench to see if you can you get the click without anything moving is it, not a terribly accurate way of 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 checking the preload for for all those reasons. Ray's wondering: Is it important um, to to have drag torque added to the final torque specifically for lock nuts? Um, oh, I see. Uh, he's talking about self-locking nuts. Uh, um, I think I've I, I've seen something about that, but it, it typically the these highly critical fasteners, you know, like 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 rod nuts and 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 cylinder hole down nuts and stuff don't use, uh, you know, friction type self locking fasteners. So, um, I really don't don't have a good answer for that. Logically, yeah, you should probably you should probably add. Uh, adds drag torque uh, to it, but it's not a situation that comes up very often. John's wondering, are there separate bolts for shear and tension? Um, well, kind of yes and no. Um, uh, the, the normal bolts can be used in in shear applications and they're generally we'll talk about this next month but they're generally they generally don't have a shear rating but the shear uh, the rule of thumb says that the shear strength of a bolt is about 70 percent of its tensile strength so that's a commonly used figure in in terms of design there there are some bolts that are specifically designed to be used in shear applications and those are called close tolerance bolts um, and close tolerance bolts are ones that are almost always used in shear applications and we'll, we'll talk about that next month okay merrick's wondering any difference in performance of rolled thread fasteners versus cut thread fasteners um you know i don't have much information about that i i, I assume that rolled threads are are a lot stronger um because the 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 metal on the threads is is compressed by the rolling process and and therefore case hardened, uh, so I would guess on very high stress fasteners that the the, the threads would normally be rolled. Richard's wondering, could you explain the slip stick when tightening to a torque value? Slip stick. Yeah, slip I'm, stick. I'm not familiar with that terminology. Maybe you can explain it. Um, I don't know if he was talking about breakaway torque versus running torque or, or what, but I'm not familiar with slip stick as a slip stick as a slide roulette. <laughs> That's the only I can think of. <laughs> that takes me back. <laughs> Mm. Um, Neil's wondering, um, there is another type of torque wrench that uses torque angle to indicate the torque. What do you think about these? Well, I guess you already talked about those, right? Yeah, I mean, there are there are wrenches specifically designed for, for torque angle fasteners that, that combine a torque wrench and an angle gauge all into one wrench. And again, these are used commonly in high performance automotive applications and all sorts of other applications. Uh, it, it, it just for some reason that it, it hasn't, doesn't seem to have caught on in, in aviation. The only, uh, the only application that I've actually seen it in is, is, uh, is Rotax. Hmm. Mike's wondering, um, could you touch on torquing both sides of a through bolt? Yeah. Um, it and this is another place where mis mistakes are made a lot. Um, but uh, in order to get um, to to be sure of getting proper preload, um, you you need to have a, a, a wrench on both ends of a through bolt. Normally, you you would hold one 
and stationary with a wrench and the, on one side of the engine typically takes two people to do it and you would you'd torque the through bolt uh, on the other side of the engine with a, a torque wrench and cylinder base wrenches and uh, uh, the through bolts typically are torqued to, to god awful high torque so the guy on one side of the engine is going to be is going to be grunting and cursing as he's getting this thing up to uh, up to final torque and the guy on the other side of the engine is supposed to be holding it still but i mean to really do it right um you really should be removing the nut from the other side of the engine cleaning the threads uh, lubricating the threads and putting a new nut on and there's nothing in you know for example if you look in the continental overhaul manual it says you need somebody on the other side of the engine um, to, to hold the the opposite side nut, but it doesn't say anything about replacing the nut or lubricating the threads or anything on that end of the through bolt. And to 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 get it exactly right, you really should be doing that. We've had comments from several people. Apparently, STP is still available. Oh, how Some about auto that? art stores? Somebody even mentioned. Um, Does Walmart Mrs. Granatelli still get a royalty? <laughs> uh, apparently, it's still available. Uh, Michael even said that um, they used STP um, at Superior Air Parts when uh, he built his engine there. Ah. Okay. Well, that's that answers that. But that yeah. that's that definitely what the what the Lycoming's overhaul manual says to use is a 90-10 mixture of oil and STP. So Joe says, I know engine fastener threads are supposed to be lubricated, but on other airframe fasteners, doesn't AC4313 say to use dry threads? Yes. Um, and and again, you, it's, it's very important that if the torque spec says to torque it dry that you torque it dry and if the torque spec say you would torque it wet you torque it wet exactly the way it says because uh, the idea is you're trying you you know the torque isn't what's important what's important is getting the proper preload and 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 some engineer has figured out that to get x amount of preload you need to use y amount of torque under whatever the torquing conditions are as i like i said on on cylinder uh, fasteners, it's always done wet, uh, and as the questioner ac accurately points out, on the majority of fasteners, the the torque spec is is a dry dry torque. So if you if you use lubricant on a fastener that's designed to be torque dry, you're going to get too much preload, and you might be pushing the yield point of the fastener, which wouldn't be good. And conversely, if if you don't use the proper lubricant on something that's supposed to be torqued wet, you're probably going to come up short on preload with all of the bad things that, you know, that, 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 that can cause. So. John's wondering, is there a tightening pattern for the cylinder nuts? Yes, there is. And, and again, for most multi fastener, critical fasteners, there's usually a, a tightening pattern, whether it's whether it's for tie bolts on wheels or or cylinder hold down things, and and typically the pattern has to do with going diagonally or, or around the fasteners, um, so to to try to make sure that that every everything is is nice and flat. And I know specifically with cylinders, both Lycoming and Continental call for tightening. Uh, the fasteners to to half torque, which they don't call it snug torque, but that's what it is, in order to get everything nice and snugged up and in position before going to final torque. And then when you go to final torque, there's a, a specific sequence that you're supposed to tighten them in. Jim's wondering, I've heard that over design for propeller bolts allows reuse. Is this true or an old mechanics tale? Um, I don't know the answer to that. The the um, uh, I mean, most of the propellers that I'm familiar with um, use um, are, are mounted with studs that are that are threaded into the propeller hub, and and then are affixed with nuts on the on the other end to the the nuts go on the back of the 
crankshaft flange. And, and I know what, whenever a, a propeller goes in for overhaul, they, they, they replace all of those mounting studs with new ones. Um, but if the propeller has to come off in between overhauls, the, 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 those things are going to get reused. There's really no way around that. There's not even, an A&P isn't even permitted to um, r remove a stud and reinstall one on a propeller. Only a prop shop is allowed to do that. So the mechanics really don't have any choice but to reuse those things. But I, I wouldn't, I would not reuse the nuts. I always use new nuts. David's wondering if a calibrated click style torque wrench just sits for over a year unused, does it lose calibration and need to be recalibrated? That's a great question. And I do not know the answer to that. Eric's wondering if you have an option, what should you drive the torque spec, the bolt or the nut? Ah, um, you would always want to tighten the nut and hold the bolt stationary. Because uh, if you think about it, if you're, if you're tightening the bolt, you're turning the whole bolt and, there, and you're adding uh, uh, more friction uh, the friction on the side of the shank of the bolt to to the equation, and the objective is to not any not not have any more friction than you absolutely have to. So, it would always be better to uh, to turn the nut and hold the bolt stationary. Fred says while Ly Lycoming doesn't publish the torque angle spec, are you saying that they use this method in their shop? No, I did not. I did not mean to say that. Well, what I said was, and I know this about Continental. I've actually, I've actually not been on the production line at Lycoming. Uh, what I said it was that they use torque wrenches to put the engines together, but they use non-adjustable ones. That, that each each guy on the assembly line has uh, has uh, torque wrenches that are that are hardwired to the particular torque that he's supposed to use so that there's no possibility that he could get it wrong. Just a comment from Catherine. I'm a quality assurance engineer with certification in measurement systems. Everything will need some kind of periodic calibration or verification. Richard says, if you drop a torque wrench, must it be calibrated again? Ask Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Catherine. What's the answer? I, I know uh, it. I know. I know the answer. If you drop a spark plug, but so we had a question about spark plugs. Are spark plugs uh, subject to this same uh, um, uh, line of thought that you've given us tonight? Well, um, I mean, I, I, I've said some generic things about the potential inaccuracies of the torque method, but on the other hand, the spark plugs are not under high stress. Uh, they're, they're not um, real critical things. So, so torquing them in place is, is, is not a problem and extreme accuracy is not necessary. We're, we're not trying to you know, stretch the plug by a certain amount. Um, it, it, I, ha I have seen cases where somebody, you know, left, put in a spark plug and, and left it finger tight. And that can cause some really bad things to happen it, uh, because the spark plug um, isn't properly heat sink to the cylinder. And, and so I've, I've seen pre-ignition happen because spark plugs haven't been haven't been tightened down, but that was because they were literally finger loose. Um, but I, I don't, I don't think that spark plugs are not in what I would call a category of a critical threaded fastener. Where, where the, where the getting the preload right is is super important. So we got our answer from Catherine. In and it's most... a soft joint. It's a soft joint, by the way. It's got a copper 
gasket in there. <laughs> Catherine says in most high safety applications, a drop torque wrench will need a quick field check to a shop torque master. Uh -huh. But Wilbur says, yes, you must. If you drop a torque okay. wrench, it must be inspected and recalibrated. Okay. <laughs> Let's not drop them then. So David wonders, why don't you just over torque all bolts and fasteners so that it always exceeds the stress amount? Be because, because if you over torque them, you run the risk of getting uh, close to the yield point of the, of the bolt and it might fail. It's, it's it's kind of like a like a jet plane. If you go too fast, you get into Mach Buffet, and if you go too slow, you stall. And the same thing is true of bolts. You you, you want it. You want them to be um, preloaded to something moderately close to the yield point, but you definitely don't want them to ever get over the yield point because then they'll permanently deform, and the and the and the bolt is ruined. It no longer acts like a spring. So uh, you, you, can't, you can't just over torque everything um, uh, because you run the risk of, of, of over, over tightening the fastener and causing it to, causing the bolt to, to stretch in a, in a plastic fashion. So that leads us to Edward's question. If you over torque a bolt accidentally, should the bolt be discarded and start probably, again? Probably so, yeah. Michael's wondering, are small continental cylinder hold down bolts as critical as on larger high power engines? Um, I'm, if we're talking 0200s, 0300s, they're, they're less, I mean, they're, they're clearly critical, but, uh, but they're, they're not torqued to as, as high a torque. Um, uh, and it's less likely that they're going to run into problems the the through bolts on big bore continental engines are are torqued to a an absolutely hellacious torque um they are the torque is so great that they can't use six point nuts regular six point nuts on them they use special 12 point nuts and the torque is so great that we've seen a fair number of 12 point nuts actually fracture in the course of uh, of torquing them down or, or shortly after the, the engine returns to service. So those through bolts are, um, there's, there's a huge amount of, of tension on them uh, because it's a very long bolt and it's a very big soft crankcase. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a terrible joint. It's, I mean, it's a real problematic joint. Uh, must have been an engineer's nightmare. <laughs> um, the, the smaller engines that that have shorter bolts that are uh, and crankcases that are less elastic, less uh, non-stiff. What what's the opposite of stiff? Squishy, <laughs> I guess. Um, it's it's just a it's it's a less less critical application, and and so the the likelihood of something going wrong is 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 less on the smaller engines. Keith is wondering, there's a big argument in one of the forums I'm on, is the number of clicks during torque, i.e. stop at first click or let the wrench click two or three times? I've been taught, taught to let it click only once. Yeah, I don't know what you'd accomplish by letting it click more than once. It if if it clicks the first time on a nice smooth fluid motion of the wrench, th then it shouldn't move. If you click it two or three more times, nothing should move. If it does, you did something wrong. Casey says the instructions with my click style torque wrench recommends resetting to a low torque value for storage. Oh yes. The, the mechanical ones, uh, you always want to do that because you want to release the tension on the, on the spring um 
All right, Mike. Well, uh, we're reaching the end here. We got a couple more minutes left. Let's wrap her up here. Um, great turnout tonight. Holy cow! I think we must have been uh, in the uh, in the high eight hundreds at one point. Oh, Please wow. take a moment and share your closing thoughts. Oh, cool. I appreciate everybody coming, and uh, I think the next next two will be equally interesting. Um, it's sort of a a set of three webinars that all are kind of relating to one another. Um, any rate, I, I, I did want to mention, unfortunately, I'm uh, about two weeks behind on, on my book that was, I was pushing hard to try to get it out in January and I obviously didn't make it. We're, I'm, I'm in the final proofing process right now and I hope it'll be out in about two weeks. Uh, but we're working hard on that and, um, uh, ownership one, uh, uh was published last June. Ownership two is the one that we're trying. I'm trying to get out now, and that kind of gives you the quick table of contents. Um, upcoming first Wednesday of the month webinars. As I said, uh, uh, in uh, next month in March, I'm going to talk about bolted joints and shear. Um, in April, we'll talk about very specifically about this, the 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 it's more about the problems with with getting. Uh, cylinders, uh, cylinder work done in the field without something going wrong. And um, then in May, <laughs> I've I've got a webinar called The Hot Seat. Um, I don't think I'm going to tell you what that's about. I don't want to. I, I don't want to spoil the surprise, but it's going to be fun. Going to keep uh, us guessing, huh? I'm going to keep you guessing. Yeah. So, any rate, those are the next the next three. And uh, uh, Tim, that is all I have. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, we have a lot of people that are thanking you for a great presentation. Uh, a lot of people remembering back to the old classroom days. You've done a good job tonight uh, as Professor Mike Bush. Thank you so much, <laughs> sir. <laughs> great presentation. And uh, to everybody who tuned in tonight, thank you all so much for joining us. We sure do appreciate you tuning into the EAA webinar series. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Yep. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We'll see you next month.